is something that overall we need to improve upon uh, because with changing climate and increasing populations, our problems aren't going away, They're, they'll be worse. And uh, we've had uh, two billion people affected by flooding in the last 20 years, uh, hundreds of, uh, and uh, many others affected by drought. Uh, the numbers that will not have safe uh, supplies or be impacted by water disasters will continue to increase uh, unless we more effectively govern ourselves and govern our water and manage our water. And that means understanding, understanding uh, the role of women, uh, the central role of women in, in water. And so uh, we have um, what I think will be the first of a, of a series of seminars on this. And this is the first one, and that's great. And so uh, from Global Water Futures and the Global Institute for Water Security and the Center for Hydrology, I'd like to welcome uh, some brave speakers who have come forward for a set this afternoon. And we have Aaron Boucher from Yellow Pearl First Nation. So thank you and welcome to the uh, university. Uh, Lalita, Lalita Barwaj, Corinne Schuster-Wallace, Lori Bradford from the University of Saskatchewan, and they are all uh, conducting uh, research in global water futures and in uh, water and are well known to many of you. So the, um, anyway, without further ado, uh, as we'll simply start, and I understand Aaron is uh, the first speaker, mm -hmm. so uh, thank you and uh, welcome here. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, uh, we're, we're setting this up so we can get uh, this recorded and online for people to download and review in the future. So we'll, and we'll try to uh, make sure we're always doing that uh, for the summer. So anyway, thank you so much for, for coming and for starting this. Thanks. I really stupidly booked myself into a meeting that I couldn't get out of, so I've got 14 people waiting for a phone call that I have to make. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and I need to get to the Thank you. Bye-bye. acknowledge the traditional territories in which this university sits and acknowledge Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territory, but also like to acknowledge the homeland of the Métis. Our first speaker is Erin Puche, and I would like to welcome her um, to the university and to this event. Erin um, is, is, is registered in Yellow Quill First Nation, and she identifies as a Soto, Soto woman. She has four boys, their age is 24, 17, 15, and 8. I'm assuming you're the 8-year-old. <laughs> the two of two youngest are at home with her, and the eldest has his own family, a girlfriend, and they have two boys. The 17-year-old lives with her sister. Erwin works for Yellowquill First Nation as coordinator for First Nation ADAPT project and specific claims research. She fully enjoys sewing, she makes and sells star blankets, ribbon shirts, and skirts. She is a fourth year undergrad and will finish her bachelor's of arts majoring in indigenous studies this year. She is interested to continue on to, on to a graduate degree. She spent most of her childhood in Yellow Quill First Nation, formerly called Nut Lake Reserve until 1989. Nut Lake is a lake located on reserve. She knew maps, or she knew about it through maps she saw at the band office. However, she has not visited or utilized this lake her whole life. To Erin, water is everything. She has participated in a fast, and she has felt the gratitude she, ha she, would ha she should have for water. Erin states, water is life. It is a cleanser, and it cleans the earth, our bodies, inside and out. Her fondest memory about water is when she was a child and she collected rainwater. She remembers being excited when the rain stopped and she would go inside to smell the fresh earth. She would then take a sip of fresh, slightly sweet rainwater. Please welcome Erin. Hello everybody. Um, 
as Lilita stated, my name is Erin Puche. Um, my maiden name is Erin Slippery. Uh, my parents were or are Arnold Yabatung and late Greta Slippery. I'm from Yellow Quill and I'm descended from the last hereditary chief, Nauguizuyas, also known as Chief Farmer. He had four daughters and one son, of which his daughter Nancy was my great-grandmother. And on my mother's side, my maternal grandparents are late Nora Slippery and late Bobby Pache. I was third generation counselor. My late maternal grandfather, Bobby, served three terms as a counselor, and my mother served four terms as a counselor. So far, I've served one term for the 2014-2017 term. Um, sorry, I'm a little nervous still. I know, small crowd. Uh, I grew up both in Yellowquill and in Saskatoon, so I consider both my home. Uh, currently and more recently, I moved back to Yellowquill. I did not run in the last election for the 2017-2020 elect um, term with the intention to complete my bachelor. Uh, majoring Bachelor of Arts majoring in Indigenous Studies. Since term ended, however, I've been working for Yellowquill. At first, various short-term contracts, and since April, I've been on as a research assistant for specific claims and coordinator for the First Nations ADAPT project. So I've been working closely with uh, Lori and Lolita. Um, I, f I feel that is that it's important for you, the audience, to understand where my background is and to know who my sources are. With my background in Yellow Quill, I'll try to relate my experiences with today's theme. Culturally, at an early age, we were taught to be highly respectful of water. Many of the traditional knowledge keepers that I have spoken with and, and have told me that water is life, and that is in fact true with the customs within traditional practices. As a young girl, I became a woman. As a young girl becoming a woman, I was trained to be respectful to myself, to others, and to my surroundings. There were new rules to follow becoming a woman, and it was considered a great accomplishment to finish that first year as a woman with a berry feast. The purpose of these rules was to protect the young lady and her power. Women are considered powerful, and even more so in the first year to ensure that the young lady did not harm others or her surroundings it was extremely important to follow these rules and to remain mindful the rest of her life while on her moon time lately i've learned more about women traditional practices within the first year of womanhood these young ladies were restricted from entering natural large bodies of water like lakes and rivers and bathing took place elsewhere water ceremonies occur in the spring and in the fall, usually led by women in the family. The offerings to the water is to ensure health and for the water to take care of us. I attribute these practices to be the reason that in the 1990s, women advocated for access to clean water. And I lived in Yelkul at the time. We had still been collecting snow and rainwater for drinking water. And the water we washed in was hauled to each household and it was always yellowish in color. The water we washed in <clears throat> and as a result I suffered various levels of infected eczema and I was not the only one. Many children suffered various skin infections during this time. The Nagisiwas Education Center was in the process of being built and was planned for completion in 1999. The women at the time wanted clean water for the children. During a meeting with, a wa with water being the main topic, coffee was made and offered to the federal agents, representatives I mean. Once they were comfortable, they were shown two samples of water and told that their coffee was made from one of them. They didn't bother telling them which one. One of the two liter jugs contained a sample from the Yellow Pearl First Nation Reservoir. In pictures, it's brownish in color. So this is before it's treated. The second sample was regular tap water from Saskatoon, which was clear and obviously drinkable and safe. After the need to explore new water sources became clear, 
They spent 18 months doing water tests all around the reserve. And it resulted in the de determination that an aquifer accessed on the northern side of the reserve was the best solution. Even using the best solution, the iron, the iron levels were, were and remain high. Based on, based on a female water treatment operator testimony. So the scientists then developed a biological reverse osmosis treatment. Sapphire now owns that process and produces and provides the equipment necessary to maintain the water treatment plant. Then the rest was history. The new innovative water treatment plant was built. During my experiences in the last four years while on council and in my current position, I have, uh, I have learned even more about water. My sources are mainly through interview and conversation with traditional knowledge keepers, my relatives, and just generally other women. I've learned more about the water ceremony held in spring, and I have heard prophecy of the water. In Yalquil, it's common knowledge that our lake is contaminated and that that is a reflection of the people. As a result of colonization and its many effects, the people have become sick. It has been prophesied that when the water is clean, then the people will go back to ceremony and ultimately become better. So far, it's been very easy getting information from community members. The community itself is well aware of the consistent water issues that surround our lives and they contribute what they can to resolve the issues. Boil water advisories are still a real thing, happening fewer times. However, even funding to keep our water treatment plant running at optim optimum levels is still not sufficient. Yellowquill still doesn't charge its members living on reserve user fees for water. And it's solely federally funded under the assumption <coughs> that we are charging user fees. The reason Yelquil First Nation doesn't charge user fees is also based on a traditional virtue. Our traditional knowledge keepers have been adamant in, ma in maintaining that out of respect of water, we do not sell water. The differences between Yelquil First Nation's traditional value system and what Indigenous and Northern Affairs imposes is too great but Yelpo will continue to challenge this. Historical wrongdoings are still being fought for, and that's how I even have a job. It has been known, actually it's common knowledge in Yelpo, of the wrongdoings of our water. The rechanneling of Pipestone Creek, our once primary source of drinking water, resulted in the contamination of our water almost immediately, which, as I previously stated, resulted in a world-class water treatment plant. Many of our elderly women questioned the aquifer in which we now get our water. One lady even stating, if the water is so good, then why do we have to treat it first? To date, Nut Lake is, is not used as much as, as it was in the 60s and 70s. During a time when the residents of Yelquil utilized the lake for many things, fishing had been disrupt, disrupted and since the band became aware of the contamination in the 80s, <clears throat> that has downright slowed down. Um, drinking water that was drawn from the lake and the, the ice taken for the purpose of drinking <clears throat> is not done anymore. The gathering of berries and nuts doesn't happen anymore. Our elderly people remember swimming in the lake and even recall how clear it was. Um, a trail is being carved out around the lake and the community has been pulling together to help fix the problem. We're always using our, we are, we are already using our plan B for water and what happens if we can't access the aquifer anymore and what, and that is what we hope to gain with some of the research being completed that is to now have a plan C or D. Thank you.
speaker is Corinne Schuster-Wallace. She's an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Planning and the Global Institute for Water Security at the University of Saskatchewan. Her research focuses on a couple systems approach to local water security and water health challenges, particularly in rural and remote communities. All of her research incorporates a gender lens with a focus on maternal health in particular. Please welcome Corinne. Thank you, and thank you very much for sharing your stories. Really appreciate that. I'm going to take us to another part of the world, maybe. And I'd like to share with you some of the experiences of women with water-related challenges and opportunities in East Africa, and particularly in Kenya and Uganda, which is where I've done a lot of work over the past decade or so. And just to start off, I'd like to show everyone what we mean when we're talking about access to drinking water around the world. And the Millennium Development Goals really took us a long way towards provision of drinking water to people who previously didn't have drinking water available to them. So by 2015, 75% coverage in 181 countries. So fantastic progress. The problem is that it was a commitment to reduce by half the number of people without access to drinking water, and it achieved that goal. But what about the other half? And what about the inequities within and between countries? This shows some of the inequities between countries. If I showed you an urban versus rural map, then you'd see that there's a lot more access in urban areas versus rural. And we all know that from Canada and from the stories that you've just shared as well. The differences between non-Indigenous and Indigenous communities in Canada are just as stark when it comes to drinking water. This actually is coverage of basic access. Basic access is defined by World Health Organization and by UNICEF as a protected source. So if it's a spring, it's got a fence around it or a, a wall that stops animals from wandering in. Or if it's a well pump, then, you know, or a, a stream, then animals aren't allowed to graze near it. So that's the level of sort of basic standards of drinking water. It has nothing to do with quality. And it also means that it's within a 30 minute round trip, including queuing times. So when we look at this, and we look at 75% coverage, and we look at the places where you've got less than 50% coverage, that means that these people don't have access to a drinking water source that has protected water quality, and that it may or may not be within 30 minutes. And in fact, there are 260 million people who don't have access to a basic water source within 30 minutes walking time. If you think about the 20 liters minimum per person per day for a family of five or six, and what that means in terms of a 30 hour round trip to bring back a jerry can of water, you can imagine how much time is taken up in this. If we bring in drinking water quality, you're looking at 1.2 billion people around the world that don't have access to potable water. It's 884 million that don't have access to a basic source. So we're talking large numbers of people around the world. This is what it looks like. And the reason that it's a gender issue is that women and girls are the main water fetchers in all of this. If a man is collecting water, then it's usually for a business purpose. So you can see the man filling the tanker on the back of the tractor at the bottom middle, and you'll see men at the water point, and you'll see they're the ones with the bicycles and with the multiple jerry cans down at the bottom because they're actually taking it and selling it somewhere else. So what does this mean for women overall? Well, first of all, let's think about women in this context. The majority of poor are female. The majority of poor women are illiterate, and part of that in these countries is because they're the ones fetching the water, and if they're fetching water, they're not going to school. If the schools don't have proper sanitation facilities and water facilities, then they're missing a month, a week a month of school. And so you can start looking at how education is compromised through lack of water and through sanitation. 
as was mentioned by John in his opening remarks and also you've talked about it as well, it's the disempowerment of women more generally and the reliance on public services and, and social services and social infrastructure. And in many of the communities in Kenya and Uganda, it's a patriarchal society and so women don't actually have access to the family finances. And so if a woman wants to invest in something, then you actually have to go to the husband. And if it's a pastoral community, then they actually have to sell a goat, which means they have to walk to the trades trading post which may be two days away to actually liquidate those funds to be able to do anything and so you start looking at accessibility in a very different light. The women also have roles in society. Care providers, they have a reproductive role and they also have a community leadership role but because of the poverty and the dependence on social services you find that if women aren't able to pay for water, then they're actually paying for it in other ways. And unfortunately, most of the people working for water facilities are male. And so you have this inherent disempowerment, shift of power, but you also have a situation where women have a currency that they can be requested to provide if they don't have financial wherewithal to do this. And so even the lack of women within water management systems disempowers the most impoverished of women when they're trying to access water supplies. And so they become the victims of all of this because of their impoverished status within communities and within societies around the world. And so this really leads to morbidity and mortality and I'll show you that in the next slide. But the bottom line is that there's insufficient participation in solutions. And again, you were saying about taking back control and the water ceremonies and reintroducing the ceremonies. And that's a way in which we can bring back control and that women who have had that natural legacy over time are able to bring it back. And it's similar in Eastern, East African countries as well. So let's look at some of the impacts and follow them through. So we're talking about lack of water, we're talking about poor water quality. I usually include sanitation because if you don't have sanitation then your first barrier for source water protection is gone. So you really need sanitation to protect the water quality. But you have water queues, there's heavy lifting, particularly when you're pregnant. The first thing that I was told when I was expecting my first child was don't go lifting anything heavy, don't go twisting awkwardly, don't do this, don't do that. And you have women who are eight, nine months pregnant and in fact the hospital facilities don't have running water so as soon as you go into labor, the first thing you actually have to do is go to the water point and pick up a jerry can and take it with you to the hospital. So again, the differences that exist. Exposure to violence is something we've looked at through a graduate student and I'll show you some of the results of that as well today. And obviously pathogen exposure, which leads to waterborne diseases and water-related diseases such as malaria. There's a lack of privacy and dignity when you're, particularly from a sanitation perspective. And all of this can lead to malnutrition and urinary infections. If a woman doesn't have a place to urinate or defecate, then she'll hold it. And if you hold things too long, then you start getting infections. So again, the ramifications, I call them the ripples deliberately, of lack of access to water become quite significant. And if we take that one step further, what that means is that the malnutrition, particularly when pregnant, can lead to low birth weight, of the child, poor nourishment and diarrhea during the first thousand days can lead to physical stunting and cognitive delays and ultimately that leads to economic ramifications and in fact there was a report about 10 years ago by one of the Canadian banks on Ill illiteracy and poor numeracy and you sort of think well why is a bank worried about that and they said well because if people don't maximize their potential then there's actually a real break in the earning potential and we want people to be earning the most money so that they can invest it back in our banks and so when you think about it from that perspective there are significant economic losses at the national level and in fact World Bank estimated that it's sort of an average of 5% GDP per country just through lack of sanitation. 
So if we look at the gender-based violence a little bit more and unpack it, we actually ask some people working in communities to understand if there were challenges with uh, fetching water. And it was really interesting because sexual assault and rape does occur, and it's opportunistic because women have to walk the same paths to the water point, and so men know where they are. And so you get sexual assault because a man's just decided to go and wait for the women because he knows they're coming back. There's a cultural element in some of these communities because men are expected to have sex with a woman as part of their transition into adulthood. And where else do you go except where you know the women are coming to and from on a regular basis. And there's also something where the girls are out of the purview of their parents. And you know, the parents know it takes them a while to fetch water, and so they actually meet their boyfriends on the path. And that's a way that they can sneak around and hide some of their relationships. In terms of another element of violence, and that's the intimate partner violence, and there, again, with the gender expectations, roles and responsibilities, there are certain jobs that a woman is expected to do on a daily basis. And they include the food, the cleaning the house, fetching the water, and looking after the children. And so if during the dry season it takes you longer to fill up your jerry cans and get back, then perhaps you haven't got time to cook the dinner. And so if you're pregnant and fatigued and it takes you longer anyway, then you don't have time to cook dinner. If you don't fulfill those responsibilities, not only is it expected of the men that they will beat the women, but women actually expect to be punished if they do not fulfill these jobs in some of these communities. And so the woman will actually forego food herself, feed her husband and her children, and not have made enough for herself, and there are ramifications then for her pregnancy. The last one is the women to women, which was a really interesting discovery as part of this research. Because of the forces of, and the fear of punishment in the house, they actually will fight amongst themselves and put the hierarchy in place, because particularly in the dry season, because everyone knows that you're only gonna get six or seven jerry cans out. And so if your jerry cans aren't the first six or seven lined up at the water hole, then you're not getting water from that water hole. And so they start ins insisting on the, on the community hierarchies to make sure that women who have greater power in the community actually end up getting the water that they want. And so actually inequities even between women. And finally, may not consider it violence, but certainly came up as part of the conversations, is the threat of physical violence, physical harm from wild animals. There were stories about snakes, there were stories about alligators grabbing a baby who was being carried to fetch the water, and so as the mother lay down, uh, bent down to fill up her jerry can. So again, this concept of what women live with as a result of poor water access. Having said this, and sort of I don't want to be doom and gloom, because as we've talked about today, there's a lot of strength in women. And this comes back to some of the differences between men and women in terms of how they socialize and the spaces they, and places that they occupy in society. So because of their roles, they're more vulnerable, but they also have strengths that they bring because of those roles as well. And so if you ask a woman where the areas of risk are for mosquito breeding to try and look at how to reduce malaria or dengue, then they have very different responses than men. They'll talk about around the schools, they'll talk about around the houses, whereas the men will talk about the industrial sites and the construction sites. And so you need to know both areas of risk because if you're trying to eradicate a mosquito-borne disease, then you have to be able to eradicate all vector breeding sites and not just one side. So the importance of understanding the different places and spaces and the reasons behind it, but also then actually acting on the information that's provided. And part of it is because women are the ones who are at the forefront. It's the women that are collecting the water. It's the women that are seeing the challenges. It's the women that are trying to generate solutions 
by themselves, for themselves, because this is their daily reality. And so how do we harness that? How do we work through that? The flip side is that women get taken for granted. And it was really interesting, the late Honorable Maria Mutagamba was the first female minister of water and environment for Uganda. And she became the first chair of the, first female chair of the African Ministerial Council on Water. So a very influential woman and remembered her water fetching days from before she got into government. And so really was a, a champion of gender rights and of women in water in Uganda and then for Sub-Saharan Africa. And so in her infinite wisdom, she decided that every community water project had to have a woman on it. And then she started visiting the communities after she passed this policy. And she realized that all of these communities didn't have a woman on the water committee. And so she started asking around and she realized that without realizing it, she'd imposed another burden on women. And the burden was multifold because first of all, it was that they're already busy and they don't have time to actually sit on a committee. The second part of it was if they sat on a committee, they weren't respected and listened to. And so what's the point of sitting on a committee and going there and trying to be effective if everyone's going to ignore you? And so actually what she started doing was building the evidence from the ground up. And they found that in the community organizations where women were on the committee and they were made treasurer of the committee, those organizations thrived. And so actually she drove demand from inside the water committees because when they saw the stories from successful water committees that had a woman treasurer, then suddenly these other water committees were saying, hey, we'd like a female treasurer, please. And so the top down, didn't actually work for her. But then when, she, but that created the infrastructure for her to then be able to work from the bottom up. And this is a quote from uh, the Sustainable Development Network, and it's that women are less likely to take decisions that improve their personal well being and more likely to seek to improve the well being of others. And that's a fundamental element, particularly at the community level, when we're talking about why women need to be engaged in solutions, because they're the ones who are enacting them. So just the last couple of slides, there is a lost potential here. And they bear the greatest burden from a poverty, domestic responsibilities, their rep reproductive role, but women are also leaders of change, and they're demonstrating their leadership roles in change at the community level and higher up. They have professional roles and they have traditional roles, as we've just heard. And being strong advocates and strong social conveners is another strength that can be harnessed. And so you can see the quote about them being essential for child development, economic growth, social development, as well as the environment integrity. And again, we heard that from you. Thank you very much. So when we look forward to the Sustainable Development Goals from 2015 to 2030, I just want to draw your attention to number three, which is good health and well-being, five, which is gender equality, and six, which is water sanitation and hygiene, but it's also water resources management and wastewater management more broadly. And the overarching Sustainable Development Goal imperatives, which are to leave no one behind, whether that's a community in Canada or a community in Kenya, to integrate between society, economy, and environment, to be far more resource efficient than we are, and to recognize the human rights. There are human rights to water, there are human rights to sanitation, human rights to health, and there's the UN Declaration, de declaration on the um, rights, indigenous rights, UNDRIP. Um, so, as long as there are governments, corporations, and individuals out to protect only their own interests, wealth will continue to be ill-distributed, financial resources will remain inadequate, and vulnerable populations, including women, will continue to bear inequitable costs and consequences. So I hope that together we can make a difference. Thank you very much.
one who's going to wrap us up. <laughs> well, I have a couple things to say at the end, but anyway. Lori Bradford is a research scientist in the School of Public Health and the School of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Saskatchewan. Her work is in interdisciplinary so social sciences, where she focuses on the human dimensions of water security, social psychology of flooding and drought, and evaluation work of how we practice inter and transdisciplinarity. She is, she is grateful for women mentors she has had that have supervised her to where she is today and wants to provide the same mentorship for other women exploring careers in water sciences. To do so though, she has spent time investigating the current extent of women's involvement in water governance and research and barriers to their involvement with research leaders should be aware of for which she, she will be sharing today. Thank you. Thanks, Lolita. Um, I'd like to thank Erin for coming today and sharing her story with us. I work quite closely with her and I've learned vast amounts. Um, and, you know, I strongly encourage everyone in this room to take the time to listen to her again and what she has to share with us. I thank also Corinne for sharing uh, an international perspective. I focus most of my work on Canadian water research networks. Um, today, um, we've heard uh, stories from Indigenous community in Canada, we've heard from international, and I want to talk about what goes on with us as researchers um, in the context of water. So I'm going to just have three broad questions across my presentation. Where are we now? Why is it important to do better in the context of water research? And present some ways forward. So uh, we've just been working with um, a student and Maureen Reed, Lolita Bardwash, um, and Maria Mora on a scoping review of uh, gender and water governance in the Global North. So we focus just on the Global North. Um, we know there's a lot of research coming out of the Global South and we wanted to see what's happening here. We followed ARCSI and O'Malley's protocol for scoping reviews, um, and this work took place over about an eight month period. So we, we investigated two concepts um, in the table on the, I guess on your left hand side, are the concepts associated with water governance. On the right hand side, concepts associated with gender. So we went through uh, dozens of different scientific at, um, databases as well as grade literature, government uh, research, watershed association research, um, to look at all the publications about water governance and gender in the global north. Uh, we thought it would be a very big project. What turns out is uh, we scoped 579 total articles of which 26 were selected for inclusion. So they mentioned gender, they happened in the global north, um, and they had to do with water governance. Uh, so out of almost 600 that came up from searching, only 26 articles have been written since about 2006 on gender and water governance in the global north. So on the top of this, t of this um, figure you see 12 articles that are disconnected from the others. So they don't cite other people's work, um, nor are they cited later on. On the bottom half of this we see the rest of the articles, 14, um, that do cite each other to some degree. Um, for this work, it's really driven in the year 2013 by a special issue of the G Journal of Cleaner Production, which was on women's involvement in the, the production of water. 36 out of 43 authors that contributed to these papers were female, two were unidentifiable by their names or by searching. None of the articles that we found looked at um, gender plus or so LGBT or TBQ2 plus status. It was just a focus on women and water governance. So in the global north to this point, there hasn't been any publication on um, non-heteronormative involvement in water governance. There were 16 critical reviews, four case studies, three survey-based articles, and a couple on focus groups that used focus groups as their primary data collection. The data was drawn from Canada, United States, Mexico, some Latin American countries, Australia, New Zealand, India, Denmark, Holland, Wales, um, Peru, Nepal, China, Scandinavia, and Russia. So quite a broad spread over the global north. 
Um, and here we see one more um, article that came from the same journal, the Journal of Cleaner Production, but it was, it's not connected. So what this shows us is that the discussion, at least in academia, about women's involvement in water governance is not really expanding in any way. Uh, it's not really connected to each other, it's episodic. When we read the articles, we found there were six broad themes um, that were um, put out in order of um, occur or sorry, in order of frequency in the articles. The first major theme was that uh, there in water governments there's a lack of place-based needs and place-based governance, um, which could really benefit from women's involvement. So most authors, so 15 out of 26 of the author of the papers, emphasized the need for different water governance approaches that were not directed by political and economic powers, but instead were driven by social concerns. And these were most often to be brought forward by women when they were involved in water governance. So the role that women play, like we heard from Corinne and Erin, um, brings different values into the water governance discussion that we wouldn't have otherwise. The second theme was how most of the research um, uh, was about opposing approaches. So in most of the literature, there was either a neoliberal approach to water governance where water uh, individuals compete for their access and, um, and access to a resource versus a feminist approach, which was about equal access. So it's great that there are two um, approaches being presented, but what is happening in the literature is that the the sibling rivalry between these two approaches isn't advancing the discussion about women's involvement in water governance. It's taking up a lot of the space where solutions could come instead. So it doesn't advance the inclusion agenda. The third main theme was that in the past, critics used very narrow definitions of a women's role to gain a voice in the discussion of water governance but we found that referring to women in narrow ways diminishes their potential contributions and the diversity of women. Uh, we're not all um, connected in some glorious way to nature the way we've been envisioned in the past. We used that kind of approach in the past to, to have a voice at the table, but that really diminishes all the values that women can bring to the discussion of water governance. In fact, in the articles that we read, um, the women's roles in water governance included the household sanitation manager, the cook, water hauler, water financier, water board ethics manager, water educator, innovative leader, sovereign water user, social manager, community nurturer, water memory keeper, hostile water claimant, and water decision maker. The fourth theme that we found was, we saw it earlier in Corinne's slides, that necessity is the mother of invention. In this case, it's the mother of meta-invasion. Invention. Women in the global north have different roles, responsibilities, and situations with respect to water, and we apply different definitions to water, present practical and holistic knowledge of water, and a variety of different water strategies because of necessity. We're often the ones making decisions about our families, about our societies, um, in an underground way to support other people. So we could bring that kind of knowledge forward. The fifth theme was that the challenge of water governance was described as something that's interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary and needs multiple ways of communicating with a variety of different audiences. So part of the problem was in the past, creating a gender platform amidst all the interdisciplinary needs to solve these problems was difficult. So gender researchers um, really um, found entry points by essentially essentializing women as the nurturer uh, when that isn't always the case. So current advocacy is pulling away from that to better represent the wide uh, ways in which women can be involved in water governance. The last theme that we found was in the global north, the biggest problem is what we're not doing. Um, so in the southern context, there is a lot of research coming forward on innovative ways to involve women, to overcome power structures, to make, to make bottom-up approaches. But water injustices are present in Canada too, and in the global north, and yet we don't have the same um, breadth of research coming out. Processes of colonization have exacerbated marginalization when indigenous people were dispossessed from their traditional territories. We have issues of jurisdictional power, culture, voice, and worldviews clashing, and this is Canada. 
this social, cultural, and political dispossession negatively affects our, our ability to bring values and beliefs into the conversation. So the scoping review actually led to more questions. The first, are we being spectators in the global north? Are we as researchers just watching what's going on in the global south and hoping for an answer to come from there? Why is our publishing perfunctory and episodic? Why aren't we advancing conversation and engaging uh, researchers that are looking at women and water governance? Why don't we look at untested research? Why are we totally stuck on that sibling rivalry between neoliberalization and feminist critique? Why are there only a few pioneering women moving the agenda along? You know, we, we all have research programs around water. Our main focus is not to advocate for women in water, and yet we, have the, we are the ones that also have to carry that. And why don't special issues drive advancements like they do in other um, contexts? So you might think, okay, this is all from the literature. Um, what's actually happening in Canada? Well, I did some research and the major Canadian research networks having to do with water and looked at their involvement. So um, in the columns percent women, percent men, where possible I got the um, sum of, of women and men in projects including the PIs, the co-Is, the collaborators, partners, and any students that have been funded through networks. Um, in the Global Water Futures program, I wasn't able to get that information yet, so it just includes project leads. So we see in the Canadian Water Network, um, they've looked at this over several um, in the water research world on how we can overcome some of these problems. First, include from the outset a gender component in your work and encourage others to do the same. I know I get emails from different researchers saying, hey, we got this project funded. Would you mind just tacking on a little gender part to it? And, and to us, that's kind of like on top of everything else. I'm doing and um, you know, engaging us in the conversation before about how we can do this is a good way to actually reflect on your own biases. Publish your gender-based work and respond to other works so that encourages the ongoing conversation. So if you do have a data set that has a gender component, don't just let it sit, publish it. Engage in multi-scaled networking from the local to the global. So here, we're on campus at the university. We've invited Aaron in and others from the community. We're at a, we have a local scale networking opportunity, but we should be doing this on a global scale. I know I went to the International Water Security Conference in June in Toronto, and there were very few women there, and I was not feeling very engaged in the conversation. Foster alternative methods and modes of knowledge creation. What we know about women is that um, on the ground, we think of innovative ways to do things and to share information with others. Uh, we can include that in our research networks. And then finally, or two more actually, make women's involvement everyone's job. You know, 36 out of, 40 th out of 43 of those authors were women. It shouldn't just be us bringing this agenda forward. Uh, we should think about all the, the young girls coming up after us too. And reflect critically on your own biases. When you see a woman researcher in a hallway, don't ask her first about her kids. Ask her about her research. She is an equal. Recognize that some involvement is tokenistic um, and that even if a woman is participating, she might be coerced into participating and sharing somebody else's views that aren't her own, somebody who may be dominant to her. Participation should be, shape, should be a safe place. Thank you very much. up to any questions from the audience? Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yes, that's a good idea. Did you guys come up and I know I have a few.
Um, do you think that's something that's gradually going away? Like the, it's becoming a more level playing field? Like I remember going to um, Howard Tweeter's retirement. So they brought in people globally, leaders in the field. And it was hydrology, so it's fairly male dominated. And I think it was, was it World Women's Day or something while we were there? Yep. So they got all the women into a room. And the small group of us in the room, I looked around and I was one of the oldest. And that was really strange to me because in the group as a whole, with all these distinguished people around, I was youngish. Well, no, <laughs> I'm not young. But it was quite a change to see how there were so many young women in the room. And I think that's boding well for the future. What, what do you think? I think so too. I think there's three challenges. Um, the first things. I think there's three challenges. Um, yes, I'm encouraged by the numbers and actually the, the shirt network by Karen Backer has um, a lot of, of diverse gender involvement and not just um, the normative ones. But um, the three barriers that I see are first an institutional one. Even in scheduling this meeting, um, we had to consider things like school pickup after you know and um, there were other meetings going on at the university who didn't want to change their time to accommodate this so uh, there had to be you know that consideration in our institutional practices the nine to five the having the distinguished lectures at the time that they do that reduces the opportunity for women who bear most of the responsibilities of, of home and child care to be involved the second is tri-council changes. Um, SHRC has been quite forward in supporting things like childcare and um, uh, nursing children being able to travel on research funds to for, for their parents or for their mother to go in and do research. So when there's more change like that across all of the funding agencies, then I think there'll be more active women's involvement. And the third barrier is just societal awareness. So having things like world, you know, the w Women in Water event and broadcasting it more widely um, will change the views in society that women can and do the do this work very effectively. Um, so uh, once those barriers start to lessen, I think we'll see more of an equalization. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add that one of the elements is making sure that the younger women are supported throughout because what you find in disciplines such as engineering is that there's a huge drop-off rate and so how we're getting young women in and that's fantastic but how do we support them coming through and how do we support them to be able to choose to have families and as you say still engage and be an academic researcher and on the same page I have a colleague whose children are still sort of teenagers and younger and was denied a, parent, a sabbatical because she'd just been off on parental leave well at what point do we equate maternity leave and parental leave Right. Uh, sorry, maternity leave and, and sabbatical. So unfortunately, there are these biases. And as you say, until we have the conversations and until we start looking at women and saying, what do you need and, and how do we need to program this? We do it in research and the work that we've been doing, we've gone to women and there's no point having a focus group at lunchtime because they're home cooking the meals for their husbands and there's no point having one at other times. So actually choosing the times to be able to hear women's voices and not just assume that women will come out because we've asked to hear their voices. And so it's meeting women where they are across all disciplines and sectors. Leela Harris actually did some work uh, interviewing young women involved in in water research and one of the major findings of her work was that women want women mentors and when they look at the mentors they don't see themselves um, often the mentors that they had if they were women they didn't have children or they had a spouse who supported them with their work at home um, so that they could advance this career um, so you, you know seeing another woman who's got young kids and who's doing the juggle um, is something that the younger women mentor or younger women students wanted, and they didn't see that in the water world yet. I can't um, 
carry this all the way, but would you mind just standing up and okay. speaking loudly? Yes. Attached to this uh, <laughs> I just, yeah, I was just wondering if you had um, an opinion on, I, I read something about um, competition between, you know, potential women mentors and, you know, younger scientists or something. Um, you know, because there are so lit, so few that you, that the older women felt threatened by younger scientists coming up, and so how to eliminate that that thought that <coughs> they could be replaced by a new person. I don't know. I feel like I'm dominating all the answers here, and please step in. Um, I actually did experience this firsthand in one of my postdoc placements, um, and it was a conflict that is ongoing. Um, and uh, you know, questions about my ability to to do the job while I was still nursing a child and, and traveling with a child to rural communities in northern Canada. Um, so yes, that that competition does exist. We're hoping in the networks that we're involved with um, that we actually bring them together so that we can be interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary and um, open, more open to this. The, the, the water world in Canada is quite small. Um, and a lot of the, the women water researchers do research along the same lines, political ecology, equality, um, feminist theory. Um, so yeah, there is some inter-competition, but we recognize this and we're trying to change this by working together more. Is, is there a competition in the indigenous community <laughs> in terms of, um, you know, I, I know competition isn't something that is um, a principle, um, at least from, from what I've learned from um, working with indigenous communities, but is, is there any sort of competition in relation to um, uh, indigenous movements or anything like that that you can think about? Sorry to put you on the spot, but I just thought it would be interesting. Or maybe in again. Well, because you mentioned there's some competition. Well, I, I really don't ever feel any competition the older I get. And if there's somebody younger and who, you know, is doing the same thing I'm doing, we kind of help each other out. And and that's, be that's because it's a matriarchal system. Um, I'm not sure if I can explain it um, okay, so in a matriarchal system, you follow the women, you follow the, the lead woman who know, who's knowledgeable, and you, you practice under her until you know what you're doing. And so there's never any competition, really, like even, um, like, within Crees that I've known, like, I, I haven't, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's all because we, we're all suffering the same um, hardships. We, we feel for each other. Like everybody that I've met, I, I, I really cannot answer that question. You know, like no, that's you just the best. Did. Actually, you just did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Erin. Appreciate sure. that. Because um, just from my experience, that's what I've learned that competition isn't something that is in the worldview. Um, from the indigenous perspective. That's at least what I've learned. Um, yeah. uh, maybe just a different spin on that question. I wonder in the indigenous community, if you're seeing um, maybe that similar movement that we're seeing in some of the younger sort of tech fields of women, is it happening in indigenous community to have um, the younger women interested in science or engineering or water in any aspect? Um, to your knowledge, in your conversations, uh, or Yellow Quill, or any of the other work that you do? Whether from science or from traditional knowledge, like whichever <laughs> way. Okay. Um, I can't say that I've ever experienced anything along those lines. Um, like with technology. For example, okay, um, myself and my auntie were on the, on the uh, we, we got on council at the same time. She is absolutely not tech savvy, like at all. And I came on and I could operate my phone, you know, do basic things on a computer. But 
she also on on her on her end she had 12 years of of um experience being in that position so it was more of an exchange you know i i kind of helped her with her tech stuff and she helped me be a better leader i suppose or um she mentored me well we mentored each other on different planes we just kind of accepted each other's knowledge base i'm not sure if i answered your cur your your question uh, i think i was looking for maybe more of the high school or uh, i guess that high school or early post early graduate from high school if there's if you just feel a, a more interest of those women in water knowledge or career or just uh, awareness of water issues through your work that okay um well okay now that you put it that way I, I i can speak on that um there is a huge gap between my generation and the next generation huge um in my generation i was still hauling water and we didn't have running water in the house we were hauling wood you know and we could appreciate these things and so this generation that's coming up now they don't really have the the same ethics or values that we have and it it it's it's a struggle trying to pass that on and, and keep them interested so we've been trying different i don't know different teaching methods i guess and um uh, i don't know it's it's not complicated it's just trying to relate to them is different um i'm not sure if i answered yes. that again did i yeah. <laughs> i hope so <laughs> thank you are there any other questions yeah. does anyone have any questions to, for one another on the panel <laughs> <laughs> no I have five pictures I want to share with you just to wrap things up if that's okay if I can indulge you yeah. and um, thank you very much not that I, not that I want to steal the show or anything <laughs> issue around time and access and um, for those who don't know me I've been working with the um, Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations um, independent nations um, uh, non affiliated with the FSIN as well as those affiliated uh, on issues around drinking water supply and access and I just want to leave you with five five major images and I just want you to go home and think about these so this is a so um, what we heard today is that there's an issue of time, time to, to fetch water and access to safe drinking water supplies. And this is a picture of a, sand, a standpipe in the Pekagamum, um, Pekagikikum, sorry, First Nation in Northwestern Ontario. This is a community where 80% um, of homes do not have running water. Now underneath there, I have a quote um, that a, whim, a woman shared with me from a Saskatchewan First Nation and she says I drive all the way here to come and get it and she's talking about water and everybody else like even these people that are on social assistance that have to pay for a cab to come and get their water over here because they don't drink their tap water so you see a bunch of people come here with five or ten jugs enough for a full month until the next time the money the, um, they get money in. The next picture is from Wasagamac, First Nation in Manitoba. 
and the washroom consists of a slop pail placed under a toilet seat and the bowl on the counter is a sink. And here's another quote, um, and this comes from a grandmother from um, a Manitoba First Nation. She says, I am a grandmother, auntie. I have children in my home. When there is no water, I cannot give them a bath. And it speaks to the issue of women playing um, their role as a child carer and provider for the family. Um, this is a picture from um, Northern Ontario at the Weagama uh, First Nation. And this is a picture of Chief Dana Kanadi where she's unloading cases of bottled water in her community. Her community has been without um, clean drinking water for two weeks and um, they had to fly bottled water in. And here is another uh, quote. Um, there has been, um, as um, Aaron and um, Corinne have mentioned, there are issues around schooling and education um, in relation to access to drinking water. And there have been closures of schools as a result of um, contaminated water supplies within the school. And some of these um, events, even if we think about the flooding on First Nations in, in, in Canada, there are over 2,000 First Nations who, have, who were flooded out of their homes in 2011 and have yet to return. So here's another quote from a Saskatchewan woman um, from a community here. We used to have a little reserve, or re, re, reserve osmos, reverse osmosis plant in the school, just for the school to have good drinking water, because there are fountains in the school, but you can't drink them from them. Like, they tried to, but they got sealed up with all that crud in them. So we just shut them down. So now, one of our workers has to come and get the jugs in each classroom. So you have to haul our water from the smaller treatment plant too, for that. You can't even drink the other water. So when it gets hot out, they're hauling water steady because kids need water all the time. And the last few pictures are, are positive solutions and pol positive movements moving forward for Indigenous um, women. Our uh, women are reclaiming their role as caregivers and, and water keepers. And um, here are some examples. So Josephine Mandeman, who's an Anishinaabe um, First Nation, uh, woman started the water, water, Mother Earth Water Walks in 2003. Another um, way forward for Indigenous women are um, creating gatherings through song, prayer, and um, and art. Here's a picture of an artistic rendering for um, support of the um, pipe um, protest regarding the pipeline pipeline in the Dakotas. And here is another um, movement in by the Indigenous Peruvian women in March of this year, 2018. Uh, there are four Indigenous women water protectors from the per Peru's Amazon who were protesting against um, Petro Peru and the, and the movement of oil in their communities. So um, just to um, uh, close, I'd like to thank Erin, Corinne, and Lori for their insights into um, water and women, and water is a women's issue, and let's work together to um, explore some solutions. So thank you. Thank you, everyone.